We have Arthur and Jalisa, pastors <laughs> of United Church in Atlanta. And, yes. and we're going to do this in like two different parts, all right? Okay. Okay. We got like a part one and a part two. Um, <laughs> and part one is this. This brother got COVID-19. Yeah. Got COVID-19. And I, I want you to hear, there's a God story yeah. Yeah. associated with that. So tell us about your, your experience with COVID-19 yeah. and what God did. Well, I'm honored to be here, Pastor Dustin. We're honored to be yes, here today. And we just love the New Bridge fam. Yeah. Uh, you all are just such a tremendous support to our church and a prayer covering and just love family. New Bridge. Yeah, family. We're, family. We're, we're part of the spiritual family here, so honored to be here. But yes, yeah, Pastor Dustin said, uh, back in March, March 25th, um, I actually was rushed to the ER with mm -hmm. COVID-19. And so I'll kind of back up a little bit That's and tell story. how that happened. Um, so, uh, you know, I was just living life, you know, doing ministry in our local community down in, in Atlanta, downtown. And uh, I began to get a fever, get some body aches. I'm like, oh, my goodness, what's wrong with me? You know, hopefully I don't have the virus and my health began to, to decline very quickly in a matter of days. And one night I woke up about probably three or four o'clock in the morning needing to use the restroom. And I was just so extremely hot uh, to the point where actually I was feeling like I was suffocating. Mm -hmm. uh, my body was so weak, um, I could barely even walk. And I was like, I, I felt like I was almost in a trance-like state, Pastor Dustin. And uh, I, I thought, I said to myself, oh, my God, I'm about to die. Uh, I'm about to die. So I'm, I'm about to die. And I was so hot, suffocating. I was like, well, the only thing I could think of instinctively was like, I can just maybe stumble to the kitchen, you know, through my bedroom. And if I can just get to the kitchen and, and like put my head in the freezer. Like that was <laughs> cool literally off. what yeah. I was thinking in my mind because I'm a survivor, you know? And so I just was like, I, I just, I stumbled to the kitchen, uh, put my head in the freezer and I just began to take deep breath, deep gaps of breaths and trying to cool down, feeling like I was about to die. And I just faintly called out my wife's name, Jaleesa, Jaleesa. And, you know, as I, I didn't think she would even hear me, but as she, uh, she did, thank God, she came out of our bedroom and I actually passed out in the kitchen floor uh, and hit the floor. And, and uh, Jaleesa, I kind of let you pick up there and, yeah. and what you saw when you walked in, seeing me on the kitchen floor passed out. So <laughs> actually I, um, what, I made it to him before he passed out. And so that's kind of like how his, his mind was kind of out of the experience. But that night, you know, all night he breathed very poorly. Um, he sounded very bad. It's just sounds that I never heard him make before. And I actually had pre-planned in my mind because I'm a planner. OK, tomorrow I'll go to the office, put in an hour or two, let my boss know we're going to get him to the hospital. But um, he also had the cough, and it was just very strange. And so and this is March 25th. So this, it's, it's kind of in the early March. days of oh yeah exactly this becoming a thing, especially here in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And so during that um, that night, you know, I was listening to him. He would you know just be breathing very oddly. And so I saw him go to the restroom, and then I saw him walk over to the kitchen area, and I finally heard him call out my name. And so by the time I get there, um, his head is in the freezer and I'm like you know you're okay you know stand up and I can see him rocking and then he just passes out um and so he hits the ground and I actually fall with him um because he has like no control of his body and so um for a few moments there he's yeah he's laid out there on the floor um and you know I have to be honest right with people of faith but at that time fear definitely gripped yeah, me sure. Um, just being honest with you guys. And so it took some time for faith to kick in um, because he was 
he fell on top of me. I had to get him off of me. I'm looking at him. And, you know, we had had by that time so many news reports, right? All the media things are like running in my mind too. And I'm looking at his eyes. His eyes are to the side. I'm looking at his mouth. It looks very dry. I'm looking at his, the color in his skin. And it's not, you know, this color that we see today. It's like a, a bluish almost. And I'm, you know, freaking <laughs> out. Yeah, yeah. 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 Good. So it, you know, it was very um, in, intense. And in that moment, just, you know, I had a lot of fear. But interestingly enough, our parents were at the house. And so I called them down and they start, you know, helping me. Um, and we're all people of faith again. But in that moment, fear That's definitely scary. crept in. And so it took, it probably took a good, I don't know, 60 seconds to a minute for faith to like, kick back in and mm -hmm. like literally grip us to where we started, you know, like we weren't even saying like these eloquent prayers anymore. It was just Jesus. Jesus. Like yeah, we just yeah, yeah. started seeing Jesus, Jesus yeah. declaring faith. And so, you know, he, he coughs, a liquid comes up. And so we pick up from there, calling the ambulance, like getting him out and onto the hospital. So, yeah. So I end up at the hospital in the ER. They give me a test and they, they, check me into the hospital and I'm there for, you know, I end up being there for 12 days. I didn't, I didn't think that I would be there for 12 days, but of course that experience was, I mean, life altering. I've, I've never been that sick in my life. The body aches, the fevers, the, the physical pain. Um, I can remember you know, them, they didn't, they don't have a cure still totally. I mean, uh, they would come in giving me, I, I don't believe I'm exaggerating. I think I'll be taking like 20 pills a day, you know, uh, all kinds of blood thinners. And I had to be, had to have an IV. I was hooked up to oxygen. They didn't give me a respirator, but I had to have four liters of oxygen a day. Um, of course, the hospitals were closed at that time. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, my family couldn't <coughs> come in couldn't and see. see me. The only people I could see was the doctors and the nurses. I mean, I was in a place of, in despair. I mean, I was, I was sick. And there were moments, Pastor Dustin, where I actually said to myself, okay, well, Lord, is this it? Is this it? Is you this know, it? is this it's it? my ticket. You know, and it's going to get good here in a second, but it was, it was, it was dark and bleak. And I remember asking the Lord, I said, well, I'm not really, I wasn't afraid to die, actually. I wasn't afraid to die because I knew and this is hope for believers, for you, in all of the crisis that you may be experiencing. In that moment, I was not afraid to die. Why? Because I knew where my eternal salvation was in yeah. Christ. I knew that I was a, a child of God and that to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. So I didn't fear death. I think the yeah. biggest thing that I was mostly concerned with was, Lord, have you, are you pleased with my life? Yeah. Are you pleased with my life? The legacy that I will leave behind and, and my wife and my, the people that I've discipled and ministered to in the church that I've led. Lord, has my life been pleasing to you? Have, have I done what you've called me to do? Is this the end of the road for me? If so, have I fulfilled the mission that you've called me to fulfill in the earth? That was primarily there. And of course, you know, after 12 days, you know, the Lord allowed me to get out of the hospital room. But let me just tell you about what helped me, pulled me through. If a few things happened in the hospital during that 12 day period that really encouraged me in my in my time of despair. I feel like it was a almost like Joseph, like mm -hmm. like a pit season, you know, mm -hmm. being thrown into the pit. You know, uh, a couple things happened. One, uh, I just want to say how important it is to have a godly spouse, a spouse that uh, will encourage you in your time of despair. You know, they wouldn't allow our families to come into the hospital room, but my wife was so determined. It was like her faith kicked into overdrive. And what she did, you know those science boards that you do science projects on, those yeah, white those boards that open up? up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, my wife went to the store and got those science boards, those whiteboards, and she wrote scripture all on those boards. <laughs> and she will write scriptures like, you know, you have not been given a spirit of fear, Arthur, but one of power, love, and a sound mind. Yeah. She will write things like, 
you know, you are healed in Jesus name. And 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 she would get the nurses and they, they say, well, ma'am, it's against the policy for us to take anything. into." She's like, no, you're going to put this up. You're going to take it into my husband's room and you're going to put it up in so he can see it mm. so he can have something visually to see. <laughs> she made sure my she delivered my Bible to the room. She delivered a journal. I mean. This woman was determined to see me make it out of that hospital. And so I just want to just celebrate Jaleesa. And, mm-hmm. and because it was her miracle, it was her mm-hmm. prayers that really kept me encouraged. And I believe that pulled me through ultimately. Um, and so that was a tremendous level of encouragement. Do you want to just speak to what was going through your mind and heart in that time mm-hmm. of? Yeah, well, you know, initially, like I said, I was gripped by fear um, and it, took a couple minutes in the initial moment to like for faith to kick in. And so then I said, well, I got to hold on to this. And I'm like, I'm going to kick it up a notch, you know, like, Lord, this is where we're at. So here we go. Let's walk it out. Like, what do I need to be doing? And so um, like I, I got my parents involved, my sister, I was like, this is the plan. You know, we couldn't get into the hospital, but hey, we're going to be outside. Um, we will actually go out and pray on the outside of the hospital. She was having prayer meetings outside of the hospital yeah. building praying for, you. Praying yeah. for me but they were, y'all were praying for everybody yeah we just started praying for <laughs> the <laughs> nurses or other patients in the hospital who might have been admitted for the same thing or whatever you know they were in the mm. hospital for and so you know it's like like faith let's go you know um i t- had to start declaring you know like fear is not gonna live mm. yeah. here in yeah, this yeah. heart or in this mind and so in order to drive that fear out i had to start being very um driven with action yeah. and activity so yeah. like hey we're going Spiritual up here violence. You, yeah, exactly. It is, it is, it is, it is, it is, yeah, like it, it, you what know, that looks like. yeah, yeah. Start starting to fight, and so yeah, we did the the scriptures on the tribal wars. You know, I wrote the uh, nurses letters um, to encourage them because they were also going through a very hard time, not wanting to be you know close to someone who um, had the virus. Um, but just going up there daily and declaring faith, you know, was was really key. And I just you know, like Arthur said, um, having a, a godly spouse is important, but also so like having your team around yeah. you, those key community, people, yeah. um, you know, the community around you is key as well. Um, we were able to reach out, of course, to our immediate family, but many friends and friends of New Bridge well, and, and praying, IHOP, yeah, yeah. praying and sending video messages because he was, you know, in the um, hospital and, and couldn't speak to anyone. So I'd have folks sending video messages like, mm-hmm. I'm calling these five people today. I need you to send a message She was today. harassing people saying, you better send my husband a <laughs> message or something to you encourage know. him, get him through. He who finds a good wife finds a good thing, <laughs> right, brother? We got it. Hallelujah. He found a good wife. Yeah. That's so powerful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so that, but then also one cool thing that I want to share with the Newbridge family that you all don't know is that there was a, you know, I had a, ch- I had a TV in my room. Of yeah. course, I had no interaction out with other people. Other than the doctors and nurses who were very rare when they come in, they give me meds yeah, and, and leave. Yeah, and so I was experiencing tremendous levels of isolation. I mean, tremendous amounts of isolation. Um, and so one thing I, I just, you know, I cling to Christian television in that moment. I didn't want to watch the news. Yeah, yeah. And the bad reports of people dying of COVID nineteen <laughs> while yeah. I'm in the hospital. Yeah. You know, and so I had to find something that was gonna lift me up and keep my faith stirred. I I mean, I was praying authoritative prayers over myself, but I was praying weak prayers like Jesus heal me, you know, I mean, Jesus heal me, you know, in my weakness. But there was one time, one day it was, uh, it was, I turned it to a Christian channel, a local Christian channel. And I look up and lo and behold, Pastor Jeff and Sister Amy, is it? Sister Amy are on TV Wow. And yeah, on their cha- their their television show. Yeah, yeah. And I'm laying in the hospital, and guess what they're talking about? Pastor Jeff is talking about suffering yeah. and experiencing difficulty and and and, and being in uh, hard circumstances. And I hear 
uh, Sister Amy's story about being in that yeah. car wreck and losing our mother yeah. and, mm -hmm. and, and not being angry with God and clinging to the Lord and our weakness and all of the, I mean, it was a divine, it was like Holy Spirit, boom, like, yeah. like Arthur, I'm speaking to you right now, buddy, like, you know, and, and so Pastor Jeff and Sister Amy's, their, their testimony in that moment just encouraged me so much mm -hmm. and I, I can't wait to see them in person mm -hmm. when I can. Uh, just to to thank them and let them know yeah, they yeah. they may watch this at some point, but you know things like that encourage me. And of course, ultimately, uh, after twelve days, they they let me out. But the testimony in the suffering while I was in the pit, dealing with that sickness, is my nurses and doctors would come into my room and they would see whiteboards with scripture written on them. They will walk in and they will see Christian television playing. Selfie. They see Bishop T.D. Jakes preaching, <laughs> get ready, get ready, get ready. You know, they're, they're like, man, that's okay. You know, and they're like, man, you're you're a church guy, aren't you? You yeah. know, you're a Christian, aren't you? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm, a, I'm actually a pastor. Oh, my goodness. Wow. You know, well, they were they were men. It was a witness. Yeah. yeah. Even in our suffering, Pastor uh, Dustin, and I say to anybody watching, even in your suffering, in your trial, in your tribulation, your your life can be a witness. You know, it's not until the olive is pressed yeah. that the oil is produced. So good. And and that is a time in my life, and, and a time it was a time in my life where I can truly say that I know I was being pressed yeah. by God, and it did not feel good. But man, you know, what God has done in my heart and what he's still doing, yeah. uh, you know, is, is, is truly a testament of God's grace in my life and his mercy. That's so powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, to, to transition out of that thought on suffering, there's a, the African-American community yeah. mm -hmm. is suffering right now. Mm -hmm. You know, as I interact with just, just the things that have happened, the things that are being exposed, the things that are being revealed, yeah. you know, uh, about the systemic racism mm -hmm. that that exists. Yeah. You know, this is such a hard topic because mm -hmm. it's so nuanced. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so, I mean, when you begin to talk to people, there's just so many opinions and thoughts and all that. But there's one thing, I mean, if you can, if you can like cut through it all, yeah. what you do understand is that our African-American brothers and sisters mm -hmm. are suffering. Yeah. Right. Now we can debate over reasons. I mean, you can just spend, and there's some answers to, the, to mm -hmm. those questions. Mm -hmm. But if, but if I'm going to, if, if I'm going to boil it down, yeah. right. you know, my brothers and sisters are suffering. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I'm, I'm curious yeah. about what you just said about suffering, yeah. right? What, what would you say mm -hmm. as an African-American man and woman mm -hmm. to the African-Americans that are right now in this moment? Yeah. of suffering wow you know yeah. what would you say to them what, i mean what would you what would you can because I, I was i was talking to a young lady in our mm -hmm. church uh you know right now she's young and and, and she's she's experiencing the weight of this you know and, yeah. and it's kind of a hopeless sort mm -hmm. of feeling like wow. man, and, and you could feel mm -hmm. the suffering in her soul mm -hmm. but what you're even saying suffering as bad as it is and, and mm -hmm. we don't excuse the reasons Not right here, right. here let me say very clearly yeah. we don't excuse right the reasons for the suffering right. and they must be addressed. Those are justice issues. Right. But at the same time, yeah. there's a, there's an inherent value yes. in yeah. suffering as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. could you just speak to that for a second? Yeah. I just think that's such a, such a moment in time and, and, and cause your community is going through something mm -hmm. significant. Yeah. I, I'm, I want to share this and Jalisa, you can add on mm -hmm. anything you want, but I'm reminded talking about the pit, you know, yeah, yeah. I'm reminded of Joseph. You know, Joseph was betrayed by his brothers, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, sold into slavery, uh, and then God elevated him to Potiphar's house and then falsely accused and thrown into prison. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, uh, and then God takes him out of that and puts him in the palace. I mean, and then he's brought to a place where he has to confront his brothers Right. Yeah. And he has the ability to allow his brothers to starve yeah. because of the famine that was existing there. So he actually has, he has a moment in time where he has the means, the power, the privilege right. to, to avenge, yes. avenge the injustice, the injustice that yes. he experienced. That's a right. great, that's, yeah. a, that's a great, that's a great goal. And what that's happens, great. what happens is, and this is where I'm going with this to encourage 
the African American community is, is that uh, Joseph said his his brothers plead with him, like, "Oh no, now he's our father's dead. Now Joseph can have his way with us, mm-hmm. pretty much." But Joseph said, "No, no." He said, "I know what you did. It was meant for evil. Yeah. But God turned it around for good." And so I would say to my African-American brothers and sisters, I, I'm there with you. It is painful to yeah. see uh, people uh, being uh, dying in the streets, right. dying on pavements, right. seeing yeah. mothers weep at their children's funeral. I mean, it is painful to watch. Uh, but I would say to uh, those in the African-American community and to, to those in my community that God can take the things that have been done that are evil and turn them around for our good, that the African-American community can have a testimony even out of the injustice, injustice that we're experiencing. I'm also thinking about another person in the scripture, Esther. Mm -hmm. You know, God took the the least likely candidate of a 14-year-old orphan minority Jewish girl in Persia and and made her the queen so that she could save an entire nation. And so I want to say there's a call for, uh, there's a call of God on the African American community for the individuals don't give up, don't be in despair, don't give up hope. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he said though we've been pressed on all sides We have not been crushed, meaning that we have experienced trial and tribulation, but we still have hope in God. We've been perplexed. We've been we've been uh, what's the scripture say? Persecuted, persecuted, struck down, down, but not Not destroyed. destroyed. You know, we will not be destroyed. Ultimately, God has a plan in all of this, you know, to turn it around for our good, for the glorification of his son, Jesus Christ, ultimately. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean. And I would just add, you know, um, because we've been having this conversation at our church, United Church, and we've been doing um, Bible chats on it. But um, it is OK right now um, for, you know, the black community to lament and to cry out and mm-hmm. to vocalize yeah. the that's feelings so. that yeah. we feel, Absolutely. the pain and the hurt. Um, I, I think that's number one. A mm-hmm. lot of, um, you know, black Christians don't even always feel comfortable enough to share mm-hmm. with their brother or sister or a, a different counterpart. You know, so what this you're is saying is feeling. don't pretend you're not suffering. Oh, yeah. No, 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 no. Don't no, put on no. this fake facade. Look, I mean, yeah. don't pretend you're not suffering. <laughs> no. Let the suffering. Yeah. yeah. The pit yeah. is real, bro. Like, the the betrayal real is real. The injustice is yeah. real. Yeah. And, and let's, let's look at it and, and face it. Yeah. But I think you're going somewhere. With yeah, it. yeah, so it, it's okay to, you know, uh, address it um, because in doing so, you're able to go back and have a conversation with someone else and explain, okay, this is what's happening. This is how I feel. But now how do I, you know, change the story yeah. and all of this? And so it's it's key, you know, for our brothers and sisters that are not black or African American to hear and understand the struggle. Well, who else better to tell it than those that, you know, are hurting or suffering, Um, but communicate how you're feeling um, and allow the Lord to work through that. I also look at time and time again, um, when we look at history, Mm -hmm. you know, black people have um, had so much oppression, but there are so many key players that Mm -hmm. always like make it out. And we see them highlighted in history. There are many that we don't know about, Mm -hmm. um, but we, when we drop names, we like recognize like, this is what they went through, you know, even though all of this struggle, um, all of the discrimination, um, all of the, the trial, the hurt, you know, being pushed aside, being segregated, somehow, Mm -hmm. you know, this person, this black hero is able to make it out you know, and live life this way. Um, And so I think it's also important for us to realize that that is how God gets the glory out of our lives, especially as, you know, Christians. So, you know, speaking of, you know, that God works, I mean, God works all things together for good and, and, and what they meant for evil, God can turn for good. I mean, you guys have a story at the church that you pastor. Yeah. You know, we I mean, we're getting lots of bad news. You know, you <laughs> yeah. watch the news, it's yeah. bad news. Yes. And there's and there's there's a lot to grieve over. There's yeah. a lot to mm-hmm. have pain and suffering and lament over. There is. But I mean, in the midst of that, I mean, God is doing some 
incredible things mm -hmm. across the board. And, and you guys have a story. Mm -hmm. There are many stories like it, but it needs to be told yeah. about your church and what was your church and, yes. and what was it called and, yeah. and your role. Yeah. And they just, yeah. we have about, just, to let, just yeah. tell us the story yeah. of United Church. And I want you to listen to the story. Yeah. If you've been discouraged over kind of what you're hearing mm -hmm. about racial tensions and all, all these things going on, I want you to hear. This is so powerful and so encouraging to your heart of what can be and, and actually is. Right. I mean, it's it's about the calling of God. Right. Uh, it's on on the, the community, but also uh, personally, God has a call for each person. And so right. for me, you know, God, I finished uh, college and moved to Atlanta and uh, a Southern Baptist pa uh, pastor approached me. And he said, hey, um, you know, he's a white guy. A white Southern Baptist pastor. Yeah, white pastor. Southern yeah, Baptist yeah. pastor. Uh, he said, hey, you know, we have an open associate pastor position. Would you be interested? And I immediately, you know, I'm a tongue-talking, prophesying, <laughs> for the Holy Ghost, uh, uh, African-American brother. I, I was like, man, I don't, you know, I just said, I gave him the Christian no. You know what the Christian no is? Uh, let me pray about it. Let me pray about it. it. Yeah, yeah, that's the Christian no. And that's so, the Christian no. Let yeah, me I pray said, about let it. me pray about it. <laughs> that's you know, exactly right. I, I pretty much knew I was going to decline. Yeah. Uh, but the Holy Spirit was like, no, Arthur, you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. I was like, what? He's, the Holy Spirit was like, Arthur, I, the church was predominantly white, obviously. So this is, this is a white mm -hmm. Southern Baptist church yes. in Atlanta. Right. How old is, was the church? The church is like, at that time, it's probably like 90, about 90 years, well, 80, 85 years old around that time. An 85 year old Southern Baptist yes. white church. Yes. And, and the it, guy's and asking you to come and serve as associate Yeah, and it's, and it's trying to revitalize itself, trying to yeah. survive. Yeah. And, uh, and so the Holy Spirit said, Arthur, you're going to do it. And it's because I love those people and I want you to learn to love them too. Right. That's what I heard the Holy Spirit yeah. say. And so I go and tell, you know, my wife, I tell some I of my it. other college buddies that I went to school with. And they're like, you know, some of my mentors are like, man, what are you doing? That's the worst <laughs> ministry decision, the uh. career decision. Like what? Like that's a waste of time, man. I was like, OK, well, I feel like the Holy Spirit is telling me to do it. though. Yeah, yeah. I end up doing it. I serve as the associate pastor. I sit in small group Bible studies with uh, 80 year old white <laughs> folk, yeah, yeah. you know, teaching the Bible to them and learning to love them and being their associate pastor, being right. one of their pastors that they look to for ministry. And uh, we've done. We did. I mean, did you ever look around and think, what, what in the world? I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you just for had that sure. moment, like, it's oh. kind of psychedelic. Like, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What, what, how did I end up here? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But ultimately, um, the pastor moves, the senior pastor moves on to a different assignment to pastor another church. Yeah. And there's a, a vacancy. And uh, I feel called to. Uh, apply or, or to, to fill that gap. And, and this church had never had an, obviously, never had an African American, African -American pastor, pastor senior pastor. Yeah. No, never. And in fact, I heard stories about this church uh, from one of the, the senior pastors that pastored the church back in the 80s. This is the 80s, yeah. late 80s. He said to me that he was going to be baptizing a, a biracial couple, an uh, interracial couple, yeah. uh, a white girl and a black guy. They wanted to be baptized together in the baptism. And the deacons had a problem with it in the late 80s. They confronted him like, you know, what are you doing, man? You can't, you know, and his secretary this. was like, well, pastor, I don't know about this, but I trust you, you know, and he's, this is the late 80s. And so we fast forward and, and about two, 2018, I believe it was, or 2017, actually, uh, January 2017, I became the first black senior pastor of the church. We've since then, uh, the name of the church was Woodland Hills Baptist Church. We've since then have replanted it. It's now called United Church. But now don't don't leave out the part of the story. So this church oh, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. is on a road. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh my God. So and this is a great story. So the, yeah. the road the church is on is called? Confederate. Yeah. And I remember. It's called, is it Avenue? or Confederate, Confederate Avenue. It's on, Avenue. So the road of this church is on Confederate <laughs> Avenue. Yeah. yeah. Now if you know, you know I'm sure when the history <laughs> yeah. lesson, not, if you don't know what the Confederacy is, you can look it up on your own. Yeah. Right. Google it. Yeah, right. Google yeah. Confederacy yeah. and you'll know how, that's such a that's right. an ironic paradox. It's like, 
oh my God. Right. Yeah. So when you were talking about having those moments where like, what am I doing here? Like mm -hmm. I can remember like if we would try to invite people to church and we'd be like, <laughs> Okay, the church is on. Oh, I don't want to say the name of the street. Confederate Avenue. So look, it's by Come the join Zesto. our church. It's on Confederate Avenue. <laughs> you know? Can, we got a we got a Confederate flag out front waving. It's like, oh, yeah, it's just such a yeah. It was crazy. It was weird, man. It was weird. And so we went to City Hall and worked with Mayor Bottoms yeah. and our City Council, and we did a huge march with one race. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. yeah. You know, we were there. Members from New Bridge, and you we know, there. we marched and we sang yes. and declared down yeah. Confederate Avenue that Jesus is Lord, God unite the church, and and it was a, a miracle. God changed actually on the the weekend of Martin Luther King Day. Right. Yeah. Uh, we changed the name to, from Confederate Avenue to United Avenue. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so in light of that prophetic act, we said, God uh, wants a united church. Right. And so right. we named the church United mm -hmm. Church. And so, you know, uh, it's been uh, a journey. We've, you know, we, we actually were launching it this year. <laughs> and so we look forward to being able to get back into our newly renovated building and and having just a blast in worship and and continue to do ministry in the metro area. Hope I mean I hope everybody's really like catching this story. Yeah. I mean it's it's really worth just sort of meditating on. Yeah. And an 85 90 year old yeah. mm -hmm. white Southern Baptist church. Yeah. The guy I, I, you come in as an associate pastor and then become the pastor and yeah. it's on Confederate Avenue and, and just the miracle of getting the road. I, mean, I remember walking through all that and us talking and marching and and how yeah. God just just I mean, and that's not an easy thing to get a, the road, right. the, a road change. No, it's name, not. Name no, we, we were debate. We had to, we were at City Hall debating. Uh, we had hearings and we had people yeah. from the Sons of the Confederacy come out and lecture us on how we're trying to change history. And I know we're just changing the name of the street, not, not trying history. to change history. You know, it, it was crazy. I got mail. I got I got I actually got mail you know, from the Sons of Confederacy, you know, trying to tell me, trying to lecture me about all this stuff. But it, it is a miracle, and it's a sign of what God yeah, yeah, is yeah. trying to do right. in yes, America sorry. right now. Yes. It's And there is hope. There is hope. Yes. I'm sorry that, you know, I, I, want, I want people to hear that, Pastor Dustin, yeah, tonight, yeah. that there is hope. God yes. is doing something in our nation. Yeah. He's reviving us. He's awakening us yes. from this this slumber. this this slumber mm -hmm. or this like this drunkenness of mm -hmm. uh, prejudice and yeah. racism that mm -hmm. has existed for so long. But He's doing a new thing. It's a good thing. Let's celebrate. God is yeah. doing a new thing. It's it hurts, but it's it feels good to know that God is dealing with our issues. He's right. dealing with our idols. He's dealing with the things that breaks his heart. And so we, we can find hope and know that God, you, I can celebrate what you're doing, Lord, that you are wanting to unite your church in the midst of even a pandemic. He's, yeah. he's allowing a pandemic to happen, you know, to, to, to bring about change. And it's extraordinary to see what God is doing in our day. We, time. We've talked a lot. People will ask us, I mean, why, you know, you're praying for revival, and why are you getting distracted on all this, you know, racial reconciliation stuff? Like, that's an issue. That's an issue. But it really is. But <laughs> what I mean, what came out of early pastor prayer meetings is we were praying and seeking the Lord. What the Lord revealed to us that that revival mm -hmm. is dependent upon a unified church. Right. I mean, it, I mean, they were all on the day of Pentecost. They were they were all in one accord. Mm -hmm. They were united in one place. Right. Yes. So why this issue? Is so fundamental. It's not an ancillary issue mm -hmm. that we're dealing with. It's 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 actually a, an important issue yeah. that the church needs to be united in this hour. Mm -hmm. You know the whole red and yellow, black and white thing. We've yeah. got to be united right. in this hour, and that's what's going to bring about revival. I mean, that's yeah. ultimately what's going to what's going to help facilitate. Now we know revival will bring about that, mm -hmm. but but there's got to be some sense of unity mm -hmm. that's going to precede that. Garland Hunt, mm -hmm. you know, one of the founders of One Race, and. Yes. I love how he says this, says that, you know, one race at, at its core, it's not a political movement, mm. it's a prayer movement. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And that's an important distinction. Now, a prayer movement is going to have political implications. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, right? Yes. But, it's, but it's not a political movement. It's a, it is a prayer movement. Yes. And what he says is, he, I, I love hearing him talk about this because he, he articulates it so well. And then you listen to guys like Dr. John Perkins, who, yeah. who's just another, I mean, I'm so, yeah. we had him here and I got to spend time with that man just, it, 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 I mean, something even shifted in my heart mm. just being around Dr. Perkins, you know, and I and and his story is I I realized and after all he went through, he said I realized I was angry, mm -hmm. 
you know, I was angry. Yeah. And, and therefore, I, I couldn't minister like unless yeah. God dealt with the anger yes. inside of me. Yeah. And Garland likes to say, you know, un, unless African Americans are able to deal, mm. you know, with their anger and bitterness, yeah. unless white people can deal with their apathy and complacency, yes. you know. Yes. And we know, I mean, the only place that's done is at the cross. Right. right. Yeah. And that's why this issue of reconciliation being the answer to answer to racism, it's it's at the cross. Yeah. You know, it's at the cross and getting people, yeah. getting people to the cross. And I mean, what's been your experience in just, I mean, mm-hmm. just maybe just in our last little bit of time together, yeah, just yeah, yeah. just your thought process on, you know, when you see, when you watch the news and you mm-hmm. and you and you watch the commentators and you watch some anger and you and you and you talk to 10 people you get 10 different perspectives yeah you know right. you can talk to 10 different black people mm-hmm. and get i mean everything from i mean you just yeah. it's, it's it's very interesting mm-hmm. what you see out there but but taking it to the to the highest level mm-hmm. i mean getting people to the cross yeah how do we what do we do how do we do that well i think about what i'm thinking about right now pastor dustin is that you know jesus came to reconcile us back to the Father, humanity back to the Father. Uh, But he also came to bring about reconciliation with our neighbor, you know? And so I think primarily what I I think about is relationally connecting with people. I think it wouldn't be so divisive if, if we actually did the work of investing our time and energy into real relationships with people. Yeah. To be able to understand, you know, one thing I'm coaching or discipling our leadership team at our church to do with our elders and our staff and things like that. I'm saying to them very clearly, I said, look, uh, I want my African-Americans, and the African-Americans in our church, I want you to be willing to tell the truth about right. the pain that you're experiencing. Let it out. Share it. Yeah. Don't don't hide it. Right. Let it out. Be comfortable, get to a place where you feel comfortable with letting this out because we need to bear that burden with you as a church family all together. And what I'm very clearly telling my uh, my white parishioners is to say, you all, I want you to posture yourself to listen mm-hmm. and to, to help bear that burden and to listen and have compassion and empathy. And so it, that's reconciliation happening right yeah. there. And so... I think about that. I know that people, some people would like to use this, especially in uh, political government and, and the media, to use these to, you know, propagate their own agenda right now. We certainly see that. Uh, certainly people are actually getting wealthy right now off right. of a pandemic. You know, yeah. uh, people are getting wealthy off of, you know, police brutality and uh, you know, all of the media coverage that's being done or the, the riots or the peaceful... Pro- people are getting wealthy off of this. People are benefiting. But I think getting down to what really matters eternally is that the Lord said, love, your, love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength okay. and love your neighbor as you love yourself. So that's what I have to come back to the core of it all, right? Out of, in the core of it all is that I ultimately will be held responsible uh, by my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, have I loved my neighbor? Yeah. No, no matter their class, culture, or um, class, culture, or whatever, whatever the other word is I'm looking for. <laughs> camera, and you want to add anything on that? Really? Yeah, I would just add, you know, we've been able to, um, like, be a part of One Race and um, partner with New Bridge and being, like, downtown Atlanta and yeah. just um, being a uh, part of One Race in the idea that One Race is not a political campaign, it's a prayer movement. And so when you go downtown and you see destruction from riots that you might have seen on the news and you see different groups gathering for whatever reason, whatever their purpose is, but when we get together as the church and One Race is down there and we start praying and we start singing Man. and we start declaring that reconciliation And we're laying happening. hands on police officers saying we yeah. love you. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah. you. We love you. Yeah. We appreciate right. you. We're praying for the sanitation workers that are picking up the Everybody. trash. It's the <laughs> church. I'm sorry, yeah, baby. Yeah. It's the church <laughs> being the light. Right. Yeah. And that's what we need to get excited about. It. It's painful. We live in a difficult time. In the end, hey, look, Jesus said. In the last days, you will see ethnos rise against ethnos. Yeah. You will see 
plagues, famine, pestilence. Uh, you will see this, but the church will yes. be a witness in the last days. Yes. So we need to get excited yeah, right. about yeah. that. Like that's yeah. I think that's what gets me going. Yeah, like when we're we're down there and we're just praying together, speaking God's word, even like having empathy for those who don't necessarily believe what we believe, but we get to have those quick conversations with yeah. them and give them real truth. Um, truth that Jesus loves them and truth that yeah, this is wrong and this is what the church Ooh. is doing about it. Like it, it changes everything. And yeah. so, yeah, we see all this stuff on the news, but when we're active as the mm. body of Christ and we're loving our neighbor and we're on our face praying, like this is what we're going to do so about it. Right. It changes. I can remember like one day we were down there, but people were like getting a little antsy, getting a little rough. But when you, the people of God were praying and like specifically yeah. started worshiping, singing, like something changed where the crowd kind of calms Shift. down, Hallelujah. you know, and they like their ears, yeah, they're yeah. having to hear. Hear, you know, all these believers sing out. I don't, what was the one song? I don't know. Break every chain. We yeah, were break every yeah, chain. Yeah. Yeah. Like, we were there because it was it was not last Sunday, but the Sunday before. Yeah, you know, yeah. And we were there was maybe 150 of us down there, and, right. and we were in one spot. And the and the other yeah, uh, the protesters, Black Lives Matter yeah, march. They're, yeah, they're all kind right of marching here. through, yeah. mm -hmm. and they were all. I mean, you know, it just so happened that their route. Yeah. There was like way more than than us, obviously. Oh, yeah. Right. But but Thousand. they had to like march right through where we were. Exactly. Right. And you know, we were just you know singing to break every chain, break every chain, yeah. and they were chanting something else. Yeah. But they, as they begin to walk right through, we watched something happen. Yes. yes. We watched something happen. Ooh. We watched. We watched. Peace, God, peace began to, I mean, peace began to yeah. settle in. Yeah. And as people were walking, they were, I forget what they were saying. They were chanting something else. You know, yeah. it was, you know, yeah. um, was it, was no it? justice, no peace. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. 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 No yeah. justice, no peace. And, and, and that's fine. I, I, yeah. I actually agree with some of that. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly, but as <laughs> but as they're walking through, that we were watching people singing "No Justice" and they're singing "Break Every Chain," yeah. and they're like walking through, and they begin singing yes. the very thing we're singing, and just the and just the peace of God. Here's the irony mm -hmm. of that. So, wow. my wife and I had to leave a little early. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. All right, so we were watching just the mood and the atmosphere of that. So it's funny. So we were we were like walking away, and it's like that whole crowd of you know, riders. We couldn't get away from them. Yeah. I mean, like we thought we were going over here to get to our car, yeah. and, here, and here they come. So we had to like walk. I mean, massive. We had to like. Honey, she's like, honey, how are we going to get across? Because there's all these wide yeah, of people. I said, we're just going to have to go straight through it, perpendicular. Ooh, we're just going to go right through. Mm -hmm. You know, it was fine. We, I didn't feel I didn't feel unsafe, wow. but we just walked right through. You know, it was fine, and, and then. And then we got to our got to our car, mm -hmm. you know, and sure, and we're back in the parking. And sure enough, before I could pull out the car, the parking lot, the whole three mile long <laughs> procession <laughs> started coming through. And we're and our car is parked right next. I mean, we're like eye to eyeball yes. with the entire wow. uh, protest. Every single one of them. We're like, I mean, literally, we're as far as I am to wow. Jaleesa right there. We're just mm -hmm. that, that close. Right there. But I say that to say this: mm -hmm. there were still some people singing "Break Every Chain." Wow. And it, we saw the entire, we're like just so close. You can see the effect of that. Now, yes. now you may think, well, I, I mean, no, it is. Yeah. We, we care. We are glory carriers. Yes. Right. We carry the right, presence right, of right. the living God. Right. We are, we're the light of the world. Yeah. We're the salt of the earth. If we hide the light under the barrel, mm -hmm. what good is it going to do? If we, if, if our salt loses its saltiness. So, I mean, where is light and salt supposed to be used? Yeah. 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 I, you know, I, I, I talked to, uh, brother H Hazen Stevens. Yeah, yeah, Hazen. Yeah. Please, is part of uh, New Bridge and I. He said a lot of times we like to try to go around the difficult thing. Yeah. When mm. God is like, no, I want you to go right, right through it. Right in the middle. You know, right through it. it. Jesus had to go. He he couldn't go around the cross. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Yeah, he he couldn't right. cut a corner. He had to go right through it. And I want to say to anybody that you know, we talked about the COVID nineteen story. Mm -hmm. You know, we've. We're talking about this, uh, the issue of race in America, the injustice that we see uh, that has historically been happening to the African-American community. You know, we see people losing their jobs, unemployment, things like this. Yeah. It's God is, God is calling us to go through it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and I know triumphalism says like Jesus is pie in the sky mm -hmm. all the time. And no, it's like, no, Jesus is like, I'm willing to like hold your hand in the fire. Yeah. I'm the fourth man in the fire. Right. You know, I'm willing to go with you through it, you know. And, and I just want to encourage, here's the hope. Here's the hope is that God is with you. Right. Yeah. God was with Joseph in the pit. Right. Yeah. He was with Joseph in the prison. He was with Joseph in uh, the, the, the palace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
You know, mm-hmm. and, and so that's the hope. That's what we can cling to. That you know, I I I don't know honestly how I would psychologically, emotionally cope right now as an African American man. I don't know how I would cope in times like this if With I that. didn't have Jesus. Right. Yeah. Right. If I didn't have Jesus, I don't know what would be going through my mind right now. I don't know what would be going through my wife's mind. You know, I I have Jesus. I I have hope in God. And God is not going to leave us nor forsake us. Like he told uh, Joshua, be strong, be courageous. You know, every place you go, every place your foot tread upon, I'm with you. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's so good. Amy Lyle, you mentioned earlier, you know, she said something in the message a few weeks back and I've really been really kind of thinking about it because, you know, if you if you heard Amy's testimony, you know she was in the car with her mom and they were they were hit and the and the and the car was just mangled up. She was crushed in her lower legs and body. Her mom because they couldn't get her out. I mean, because the car was they had to wait on the jaws of life and yeah. and 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 her mom died in her lap. I mean, yeah. her and her mom was her best friend. Yeah. You know, and then I mean, she's laying there with her with her, Well, she didn't quite die in her lap, but she was dying yeah. in her lap yeah. and would die later in the hospital. They would get her all out, and Amy's leg is just crushed, you know, beyond. And I, I mean, just just the suffering, the suffering, the suffering. So when you hear people that talk about suffering, I I feel like to even offer anything because I don't think I've ever suffered. I don't think I've ever I've never experienced that. So I I'm very guarded when I make any recommendations to people that are suffering come from someone whoever because you just got to be so careful with that, you know. Yeah. But when I heard her share one of the things that she said was she said I realized and all that that I'm trying to figure out all the reasons why mm. you know what are the reasons why what are the reasons why what are the reasons why but but she had a shift in her thinking she said yes. we get lost <laughs> in trying to figure out all the reasons yeah. why mm-hmm. but what about the purpose of it right see that we may not, not always know why and can't figure out the reasons why but because that can leave you that could leave you really angry mm-hmm. I mean angry mm-hmm. and sort of bitter resentful maybe vengeful yeah. When you find out some of the reasons why, yeah. mm-hmm. and but what you can't ask, well, what's the purpose of this? Yeah. What's the purpose of this suffering? Mm-hmm. And it takes you to like a higher place of thinking, yeah. you know, and that's exactly what you're sort of pointing out yeah. is that, is that God can work mm-hmm. through suffering mm-hmm. in, in our life in ways like nothing else can. Right. That that right. only suffering can produce, and that's hard. Mm-hmm. When Paul says, "I want to know Him in the you know power of His resurrection and the fellowship, fellowship of His, of his you know sufferings," and I don't want to. I mean, I don't want to go out and sign up for that. No, no, I don't want <laughs> to. You know, hey, sign me up <laughs> no. for the suffering list. But yeah. but when suffering comes, though, yeah. there's a Christian posture to that. Yeah, yeah. you yes. know, that's like, okay, God, I don't mm. know why this is happening, and maybe it's injustice. You know, it probably it might well be. Mm. But Lord, what's what could be a purpose in this for me? Yeah. It's pruning. You know, I remember talking to you maybe a couple years back. You know, I was going through something as a pastor uh, and you encouraged me, you know, um, that, well, Arthur, that's just God pruning you, man. (laughs) I don't even know if you remember that That's a nice word of encouragement. (laughs) Yeah, I don't even know if you, you, you remember that conversation. But, you know, it's God pruning you. You know, it's. Being pruned doesn't mean that you're not producing fruit. Actually, when you are producing fruit, God is going to still prune you. Actually, to be pruned is God's complimenting you. Mm. You are being complimented God when you're being pruned because it it actually means you're bearing fruit. To be pruned is a proof you're actually bearing fruit. It's it's actually an affirmation from the Lord Mm. and not a punishment. Some people think pruning like, Lord, I'm being pruned. What did I do wrong? Oh, no, that's not that's not at all. Mm -hmm. Pruning is an actual sign Mm -hmm. that you're bearing fruit. Yeah, God gave Jaleesa a word on that. You want to talk about just the yeah, why I'll not just share, kind yeah, of Yeah, I'll share briefly. I remember right after he went into um, the hospital, I was, like, trying to figure out, okay, like, we got to get ready for Sunday, though. Like, we've got to record. We've got to do a couple things. And so the whole time, I, I remember that first couple days, I was like, why? What, what, what did we miss? How is it, Arthur, like, we pray for people. We do this, God. Like these were the conversations. Trying to figure that, out the why of like why are we why? having to go through the, you know. the this COVID experience, you know. And I was trying to, you know, just think of all these reasons, you know. Yeah. Even sometimes as believers, when we go through things, other people around us sometimes even like, well, you must have done such and such, you know. Like even the way we're taught when like we're growing up through s- through <laughs> school, it's like deductive reasoning. Like if this happens. Yeah. It's because this yeah, yeah. happens. Yeah, so yeah. like my mind is like racing, like 
how God? And, you know, um, the Lord just reminded me of scripture where, you know, there were people around the, the, the man who was born blind and immediately they said like, what, what did he do? What did his parents do? You know, like this man was born blind. So what could he have done? But the, the question, you know, that, um, the Lord posed back to me, like, why not you? Like, why can't it be you? Why can't it be your husband? You know, this, who else? If not you, who else, you know? And so ultimately God gets the glory out of these situations. Like you were saying, the purpose of this is something else. And I can definitely say, you know, we've had so much time and reflection since this has happened, but I, I feel like it's allowed us some time to, um, you know, like slow down and look at things. But after we've like started coming back out of this, I just see so much more fight so much yeah. more vigor, so much more faith, wow. um, tenacity, like, okay, now let's really yeah. go and preach God's word, you know? Um, so yeah, like sometimes we ask ourselves, why me? But like, why not you, yeah. right? Like let's yeah. embrace this sacrificial living, this Chris real Christianity. Yeah, so good. You know, it's that we've coming up in a Western culture, mm -hmm. you know, the majority of the Christian world you know, they know what suffering is like. Mm. Yeah. By and large, mm. you know, we Western Christians haven't really experienced great yeah. suffering. Yeah. I mean, because of our faith per se, we've yeah. had our, we've had our racial issues, but probably yeah. probably most yeah. of us haven't experienced no. persecution from being mm -hmm. a Christ follower. Right. Yeah. You know, but you're exactly right, and and you know, most of the Christian world realizes uh, they they wake up in that re that reality. Yes. In Iran and China yes. and places like that, they're they're under it constantly, but yet it's so fruitful mm -hmm. and it's so powerful what's happening. Mm -hmm. Man, you guys have just, this has been so life-giving. Hallelujah. It's been life-giving. Yeah. It's hope. Right. It's it's in the midst of the sort of the dark yeah. sort of cloud we're under. And, and there's hope in the midst of it. It doesn't yes, mean we don't walk with sobriety. Mm -hmm. right. We realize we're not in denial. Yeah. Right. We're not in denial of what's going on. We're not right. trying to wish it away. Yeah. We want to stand right in the middle, like go mm -hmm. right in the middle of it. Go on right through it. Baby. And risk, yeah. you know, <laughs> and risk. And we get a lot of flack, you know, even yeah. even, even yeah. here in a lot of misunderstanding, like, why are you, why are you doing that? We don't understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, listen, we, we may not always get our vocabulary right. No. right. We, we may not always, you know, say it right. We may not be able to stay in the center of the lane like we would always like to. <laughs> yeah. But, man, we got to get in the we, we got to get in the fray, you know. Yeah. we got to get right in the, in the midst of it because that's where love is. That's where love. Is, that's where love is expressed, and that's where the power is released, yeah. man. So power is released right at it. If we we don't want to <laughs> hide out in the sidelines and pop out and throw the ball and hide under the car. <laughs> I mean, we want to get right in the middle of what God's doing. And mm -hmm. you guys mm -hmm. went right in the middle. I, I just yeah. again, I I am so blessed to know you. I'm so, I mean, we don't know you well enough. I mean, you're a friend and a brother of you guys, and we got a, we were we we all went to a wedding a while back, and uh, at this particular wedding. Yeah. They had a time to dance. Now, if you don't, <laughs> I am, I have, I have two left feet. My wife and I took one ballroom dance lesson uh -huh. and, and the guy was working with me and actually he said, you know, you're probably hopeless. Oh man. Oh, the, uh, no. That's what he said. He said, he really is. I don't, I really don't think you can do this, you know? And so, but we had, but we had the best time. We got out, we got out on the dance the floor, dance floor yeah. and white man, funky music, <laughs> the funky music, white man yeah. thing. And we were, it was so much fun. It you, was know, you guys are just so wonderful and, and, and so honored just to be your, you guys are, are part of us. Yes. You know, you're part of our spiritual family. Yes. You're part of, you know, you just, you're who we are. And it's yeah. just so great to get to run with you yeah. on behalf of the city. We believe, we believe yeah. there's been so so much prophetic words spoken about Atlanta right. and the region, that whole vision of revival man. And, and yeah. when he stands up, he stands up in Atlanta. We just, there's a sense of, there's a sense of destiny on this yes. city and we're believing, you know, and it's going to come through a united church. It's going to come through people like you guys yeah. that walk into a, a white Southern Baptist church on Confederate yeah. Avenue wow. in downtown Atlanta. Wow. And you mm -hmm. pastor it. My goodness. Yeah. If, if, if that's the caliber of what is coming in the generations in front of us, if that's the caliber of what's coming out mm -hmm. of, 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 of African-Americans, the William J. Seymour's that are, yeah. that are, that are coming forth yeah. in African-American culture, listen, I have, a, I have a feeling, I have a sense, you know, that we white folks are fixing to be, we already are, or we're going to be schooled. You know, we're going to be schooled what God is going to birth out of the African-American community because of people like you. Wow. Where I can sit at your feet, you know, and just listen and just listen because that's that's what God does. That's the Joseph's. 
right? That's the, that, that, that endures and pushes through, and all of a sudden they're right there, and God uses them to save an entire yeah. nation. Wow. Isn't it interesting, wow. you know, that, that God would, that's just how God does it. That's yeah. how he, God loves that kind of stuff. He does. He does. Um, well, listen, we're out of time. I want yeah. you, and, and I hope, man, if you haven't found this encouraging, yeah. Well, you need. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we will schedule you for a counseling session real soon. Hey, I don't know but um, I am just so encouraged, and but I know, man, I I I know that that there are folks that need some encouragement in this, yeah. and there there are kind of, I mean, there are white folks that's trying trying to figure it out. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. there are black folks like my friend I alluded to earlier, yeah, yeah late our church. I mean, she's genuinely hurting. Yeah, you know, and and we're just in a moment in time when mm-hmm. when we pray and 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 act. Yes. You know, according with Scripture, and we believe we are we are a prayer movement, mm-hmm. not a political movement. The no. prayer movement have political implications, yeah. but at the at the heartbeat of it all, yeah. it's Jesus getting people to Jesus, mm-hmm. getting reconciled, getting mm-hmm. you know unified, and man, and the and then the revival hits. Mm-hmm. So, would you just look, yeah. close your eyes, look away, and do just and just pray for us, and then we'll be we'll be done. Yeah. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you for just such a special time uh, this evening. Uh, talking with Pastor Dustin and, and, and Jaleesa. And Father, I ask, God, that you would uh, just be the healing balm of Gilead, Lord, that you would uh, heal our wounds, God, that we look to you, Father, uh, in our time of weakness, Lord, whether there may be somebody watching uh, that is uh, suffering or struggling with sickness in their physical body, Lord, and they're not getting good doctor's reports, Lord. We speak hope. We speak life. We speak comfort right now. Lord, your word says in Psalm 103 that you forgive all of our sins and heal all of our diseases, God. So we declare healing right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we also ask God for the the current uh, racial tensions that we're seeing, Lord, that are being exposed right now. Lord, I pray, Father, that that those in the African American community, Lord, that they would uh, that they would lament in a way, Father, that they would call out to you and cling to you, Father, for the injustices that they've seen uh, in the in the in the history of this nation, Lord, and they're even still seeing now, Lord, that you would comfort those mothers who are weeping because they don't have their children with them anymore, Father. That you would comfort those who are sitting in prisons uh, that that are overfilling the prisons, God, because they were wrongfully convicted or over sentenced for crimes uh, that were nonviolent. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would reach them where they are, Lord. I also pray, Father, for, for, for those in, in the white community, Lord, especially the, the, the white evangelical church, Lord, that has such an influence in our nation and shapes the paradigm of faith in this nation. I pray that you would awaken, God, that you would awaken those. God, would you give them compassion? God, would you give them a, a insight to what's going on, Father, that they could be a witness and a light in such a difficult season of the, of, of the American church, Lord. I thank you, Father, that you are uniting your church across white, black, Asian, Hispanic, Latino, Father, what, whatever that looks like. You're, you're uniting us even across denominational borders, God. Uh, a, a, a Catholic and Protestant and uh, Presbyterian, Methodist, Pentecostal, Baptist. Father, we know that those are all just titles that men have made up, Father, but you call us sons and daughters of God. So I ask that you will unite our church. I thank you that there is hope. There is hope beyond what we see. Lord, let us cling to you even in our weakness. We love you today, God. We thank you for the many miracles that you've performed and the ones that you're going to continue to do. If you've done it before, you can do it again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are omnipresent and omniscient. You are all powerful, God. There's no one like you. You sit on the throne. You sit on the throne, God. You sit on the throne, Lord, and we will build your throne in our in our homes. We will build you a throne. Your word says that you are enthroned upon the praises of your people. We will build you a throne in our houses. We'll 
call out to you for your throne to be built in the White House, in the courthouse, in the in the schoolhouse, in the church house, God, in our house, God, wherever. God, we will build you a throne in all these places. Give us the boldness. Give us the courage to go into the hardest and darkest places to be a light in this hour. It's for such a time as this that you have predestined us to be here. In the name of Jesus, we pray and agree. Amen. Amen.